Welcome to Community Baptist Church this Sunday morning. I'm glad that you're here with us. And as we continue through our series in the book of Acts called Acts Empowered, uh, we're going to be covering a number of chapters, but uh, we'll be preaching in every chapter, just giving you some background information before we focus in on chapter 26 and a few verses there in particular. And so uh, hopefully you'll just bear with me as I give you a lot more introduction, but then we'll get into the main part of this uh, message here in just a little bit. I just want to make mention as well that at the end of the service, uh, Pastor Mike will make mention of it as well, uh, but uh, we have, uh, this is the typical the Sunday that we uh, hand out our faith promise, uh, giving cards, asking people to consider what they would give for two th- the next, the upcoming year, which would be 2021, to support missions. Some churches take it all out of their general account. Uh, we have practiced since we began this church 20 years ago now, what we call faith promise. So above your regular tithes, your tenth that you give and your offering, uh, we ask people to consider and pray as an individual, as a family, Lord, what would you put on our heart to give to missions? And so Uh, We've asked people to do that for years and for years. God is blessed in that type of giving. Uh, And so uh, that's also something. So at the end of the service here, Pastor Mike come back back up and kind of walk you through that. But uh, we just want to make mention to you that. So we have uh, missionaries who support full time on their mission fields that are dependent not only on us, but many other churches that give to them. And they're doing exactly what we're doing here. They may be doing it in a hut They may be doing it in a high-rise apartment in another country. They may be doing it in some other uh, looking way, shape, or form, but they're preaching the same gospel, and they're commissioned to go out to those areas where God has called them. He didn't put their field on my heart. He put this field on my heart, and they're doing exactly what we're doing, just preaching the gospel in different fields, and who knows that God may call one of you. Now, if you're the first person to say no, watch out. Uh, God sometimes works in, in, in incredible ways, but he may not call you to full-time mission field. He may call you to help support a missionary. He may call you to go alongside and serve there for a little while. There's many ways you can be involved in missions, both here in our own community, then of course around the world. So I'd ask you to just pray, God, put something on my heart. May, may we know how to give and how to think and how to pray about missions. And if you have questions that, you can always uh, reach out to us. We'll help you with that. But we missions is the mindset of our God. Uh, You would not be here if you were not understanding the message of missions. It's the gospel. And so if you receive the gospel, then you understand it. If you've not received the gospel, please listen to the message and receive Jesus Christ today. It is the most important decision you'll make in your life. And with that, a good segue into our message today. We're going to be dealing with the Apostle Paul from his prior to conversion to his conversion to to faith in, in Jesus Christ and then being brought up on trial for his faith And he's going to meet with several leaders, and uh, the last one is where we'll focus our attention on King Agrippa. He's going to meet before King Agrippa, and what he says there is so compelling as you're trying to present the truth of the gospel to someone who may not be a believer. This man had the background in the scriptures. He understood the scriptures, but yet he did not profess faith and trust in Jesus Christ, who those same scriptures pointed to. And so many people are like that today. And in my introductory notes here, I put the question, Can you remember the day that you trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? You may not have the exact date. Uh, I am one that does. I know I could see the place I was at. I remember the exact date I was uh, born again, that I trusted Jesus Christ. I remember the experience that I have. Not everyone has the same experience. They hear the same gospel. They have to receive Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. But perhaps you're sitting here and you can remember the year or the month or, or the exact day. But what? If you remember that time that you trusted Christ, what was that? What were the emotions you were dealing with? What was the, the thoughts that were going through your head? For me, I was emotional. Uh, I understood very clearly that my sins were now forgiven me, that God took away my sin debt, and I could now, by faith, trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ, knowing that I would not be held accountable for my sins, but then also knowing that I started a relationship with God through the person of Jesus Christ. And that changed me from the inside out. And only those who have been saved can explain that or understand that. But the scriptures speak to this. And this is exactly what the Apostle Paul went through. When we describe the Apostle Paul prior to his salvation, his name was, they called him Saul. After his conversion, they changed his name to Paul. And I won't go in the background there. It's a pretty simple explanation. But for the sake of time, we're going to go from Paul's pre-conversion state to post-conversion state, now being put on trial for his faith as a believer in Jesus Christ. 
and what message he thought was so vitally important to teach to those who were his captors. And so I want you to understand where we're coming from here today. So if you would, turn back with me to Acts chapter number 8, because we need to pick it up here. We've preached through all this, so I won't elaborate on this, but I just need you to see the background. It's been a long time since we started this study in the book of Acts. So in Acts chapter 8, this is now the Apostle Paul prior to his conversion to Jesus Christ as his Savior. Acts chapter 8, beginning of verse number 1. We notice his name there is called Saul. And Saul was consenting unto his death. The his there is reference to Stephen, who was a believer in Jesus Christ, who preached the truth. He was taken out and he was stoned to death for his faith. Paul was one, Saul, Paul. Saul was there consenting unto his death, meaning he had the authority to uh, either allow this man to be set free or the one who was given permission to put this man to death. He was there consenting unto his death. And it says, and at that time, there was great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad, meaning the church, everyone fled. They were scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. And as for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hauling men and women, committed them to prison. Can you imagine? Right now, I would assume that majority of you that are here, you made a profession of Jesus Christ. You're, you say you're a Christian or you're maybe you're on your journey to try to find out more about becoming a Christian. Can you imagine being in a church that was like this and people came in and started dragging us out of here one by one to put us on trial for our faith? Or you're at home and you're having a Bible study or you're with your family praying around your dinner table and you have your Bible out doing family devotions and they slam down your door and they come in and they grab you and they take you out to persecute you, beat you, put you in prison. This was what it's talking about here in Acts chapter 8. Saul, being a Jew, got permission from the Jews. So understand the dynamic here. They were under Roman control. Rome had this mindset that when they would go in and take over a nation, a city, a province, it didn't matter where it was, they would allow the people pretty much to practice what they want to practice as long as they kept quiet, as long as they obeyed the laws, and as long as they could keep them under control. Well, Jerusalem was known for rebels. They were known for going against the Roman authority. None of us would want an occupying force in our country. We would all want to take up arms and go against them. Well, that was hap happening from time to time. So with, the, with the, uh, Saul being on the side of the Jews, being a practicing Jew, one of the top leaders of, of Judaism in his own uh, time there, uh, he got permission to persecute Christians because these were Jews converting now to faith in Jesus Christ, whom they put to death. And he was livid. He was so angry, you would say, hatred is the word that he himself would use about how he uh, so hated those who converted to Christianity from Judaism. That's why he was so uh, demonstrative going out against them and, and either causing them to blaspheme, as we'll see, or putting them to death. This is what Paul was doing, and he got permission to do this. And so we understand that the Roman government was against any uprisings. They were against, they were against any kind of new meetings taking place. But as long as they could keep the majority of the Jews happy, they kind of let things happen. They kind of let things go. So that's the setting. And so when the Jews started persecuting Christians, they weren't large enough at the time to really make it a big deal to get Romans, the Roman government to uh, intercede for them. And so they were severely persecuted for their faith and scattered. They went to many other regions around. So that's kind of where we pick up this, this story here. But I also wanted you to just think about the Apostle Paul. Prior to his conversion... Sometimes people have to resist and even rebuke the testimony of, of Christianity in order for them to finally come to a place where they receive it. Now, let me explain this. How many of you have ever been exposed to someone who uh, doesn't matter what you say, doesn't matter what the evidence you have, they will just go against it because they just like to argue? Anybody dealt with somebody? Hopefully it's not your husband or wife. Uh, but they just will argue against you even if you have the proof and even if you have the evidence. Well, this is kind of like the mindset added to this that the Apostle Paul was so convinced that he was right as a Jew that there's no way that Jesus Christ could truly be the Messiah. 
There's no way that these people are converting from Judaism to Christianity. He took it as a personal offense. How dare you leave the faith that God gave us? He was so convinced he was right that he was against every other form of religion. There are many people like that today in different groups. We have uh, Muslims that today, right now, if you convert from certain sects of, uh, of uh, Muslim uh, religion, if you convert to Christianity, they will put you to death. It's not a question. It will happen unless you escape. That's going on right now in this current time. Well, that was like here. If you converted from Judaism to Christianity, they were going to either put you in prison, they were going to beat you, and they were going to try to get you to blaspheme the name of Jesus Christ, and, or they were going to put you to death. That's what he was involved with. That was how hateful he was against Christianity because they thought it was a mockery. They thought they were distorting the truth of the one and only true God. And so with that mindset, we, we find that Saul then becomes converted to Jesus Christ. Amazing transformation from where he was going. And so we're going to kind of walk through this just a little bit. Look at chapter 21 now and verse number 15. Chapter 21 and verse number 15. <clears throat> we see the Apostle Paul now, a saved man, giving his testimony of what he was like prior to salvation. This is going to pave the way for three encounters he's going to have. Actually, more than three. He had another encounter with the Sanhedrin council. He's giving his defense before different councils and different governors and finally King Herod. And so I'm going to march you forward very quickly here through this. And so chapter 21, verse 15. And after those days, we took up our carriages and went up to Jerusalem. There were also certain of the disciples of Caesarea and bought uh, with them... Um, uh, Nason of Cyprus, an old disciple with whom uh, we should lodge. And when we were come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. And so I want you to understand, here the Apostle Paul, now this is in the latter years of his ministry, he's now going, destined to go to Jerusalem. Remember from our last message, he said, I'm fixed, I'm planning to go to Jerusalem. And so uh, with that, he was warned that uh, not good things waited for him when he got there. And sure enough, we're seeing it come to light. Now I want you to also notice that while he was there, he was arrested because now his reputation, once being a persecutor of Christians, the same people that were on the side with him when he was persecuted Christians are now against him. He was once one of the Jews who persecuted Christians. Now he's one that is reaching people with the same gospel that he was against. And they're waiting for him. And they want nothing more than to get Paul silenced or dead if they can do so. And so in chapter 21, if you read through the rest of that, you'll find out that's exactly what happened. And uh, they wanted to put Paul to death. And so the Roman soldier had to come in and actually rescue Paul from the Jews who were trying to kill him at this particular time. Look at chapter 21, verse 27. It says, And when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews which were of Asia, when they saw him in the temple, stirred all the people, stirred up all the people, laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man that teaches all men everywhere against the people and the law. And this place, meaning they're probably pointing to the temple, saying he's against the temple. And further brought Greeks also into the temple, which was a lie, and polluted this holy place. And so here they have, the, this, this man goes in and stirs up all the Jews saying, here he is. This is the one that's been spreading the, 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 the um, false teaching about Judaism. And he's the one that's trying to convert people away from Judaism. And he's against the temple. And with the, the idea of bringing Greeks into the temple, that they would defile the temple by bringing Gentiles into the temple, which was uh, a no-no in that day for sure. Now skip down, if you would, to verse 20, uh, 31. And as they went about to kill him, tidings came unto the chief captain of the band that all Jerusalem was in an uproar, who immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down unto them. And when they saw the chief captain and the soldiers, they left beating of Paul. And the chief captain came near and took him, and commanded him to be bound with two chains, and demanded who he was and what he had done. So here now, Paul being the innocent one, being beaten up by the Jews because they were in it for crowd control, arrested Paul, put him in chains, and took him away. They actually saved his life, but they put him in prison. They put him in chains. You know, they wanted to find out what's going on here. So this is now what's going on in the Apostle Paul's life now as he's just trying to uh, preach the truth of Jesus Christ. Look at Acts chapter 22, verse 23. Acts 22 and verse number 23. So as they cried out and cast off, this is now another time where Paul was given opportunity to speak 
and uh, they did not like it. In verse 23, it says, And as they cried out, cast off their clothes and threw dust in the air. This was a sign of mourning. If you, if you ever study different custom of different uh, places, the Jews in times of mourning would tear their garment, take dust from the ground, throw it up in the air, let it land on themselves, and it showed everyone they were mourning greatly of something. It was something so bad, it was so grievous, and they would do this, and they would just wail, and they would cry out. So that's what they're doing over Paul speaking to them about the truth of who Jesus Christ is. Uh, I've never had that happen in a church service, but, you know, there's time. We'll see. Um, in verse number 25, it says, And as they bound him with, with thongs, Paul said unto the centurion that stood by, Is it lawful for you to scourge a man that is a Roman and, un, and uncondemned? And when the centurion heard that, he went and told the chief captain, saying, Take heed that thou doest. For this man is a Roman. So Paul appealed to the fact that he was a Roman citizen. Now, Paul's family from another region were able to get their Roman citizenship. Paul was able to get his Roman citizenship. So not only was Paul a Jew, but he was also a Roman citizen. And one of the rules of Roman citizen, you cannot lay a hand on a Roman citizen without permission from the higher-ups. And so the fact that they put him in cuffs, the fact that they've now kind of roughed him up a little, this is the Roman soldiers, because they thought... He's stirring up trouble. We've got to stop him from stirring up trouble. So they're getting ready to beat him to find out what it is this message that you're, you're doing. What is this message you're, you're, you're spreading that everyone hates you so much? And so they were going to beat it out of him. And he said, are you going to beat a, a Roman citizen? And immediately, wait a minute, you're declaring you're a Roman citizen? They stopped right away and appealed to the, the higher officers. So that's kind of the setting here. That's how he spared his life for another time. And so... From there, before he gets to the governor that he's going to have to go appear before, the Sanhedrin step in. And uh, this is a Jewish group of, of, of lawmakers, the 70 Sanhedrin. And so in verse number, excuse me, in chapter 23 and verse number 10, let me just read this first. So, and when there was, arose a great dissension, the chief captain, fearing that Paul should have been pulled to pieces of them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him by force from among them to bring him into the castle. So now they're trying to save his life again as he's speaking, and the people are getting ready to tear him apart. Uh, you just can imagine. Let me ask you a question, Christian. At what point here would you stop witnessing for Christ? If this is what, every time you open your mouth to talk about Jesus Christ, this is what was going to happen to you. At what point would you say, okay, God doesn't want, he's not going to want me to get hurt for my faith. He's not going to want me to have people rip me apart limb from limb for my faith, would he? The Apostle Paul looked at it differently. He says, my life's not mine. I'm to present the truth of the message. I'm to just tell people the truth. And how different is that from us today if somebody looks at us a little funny like, ah, oh, you know, maybe I shouldn't talk about my faith. Here's somebody who can't even pray publicly at work or in a restaurant or with their family. They're, they're embarrassed about what people might think about them. All right, moving on. In verse number 11, chapter 23, verse number 11, it says that, um, And the night following, the Lord stood by him and said, Behold, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. So the Lord appears to him and says, Paul, you're not done yet. I've got more for you to do. And I'm sure that was a great source of encouragement to the Apostle Paul at that particular time because of what he was going through. And so now they have him meet with the uh, Sanhedrin. And in chapter number 24, beginning in verse number 1, we see that he's going to appear before Felix. Now Felix was the governor and at this particular time, to, for him to appeal, because of his Roman citizenship, he had to appear before a governor. And so Felix now is trying to figure out, okay, what's this all about? I don't understand. You religious people, you're all wax anyways. What's up with this? Why can't you guys get along or just leave each other alone? And so he's now trying to figure out what's going on so he can um, make a determination of who, knew, who now to pass this on. If he's going to appeal to Caesar, then they have to have the right information, right evidence in order to pass this on. And so without laboring this, he goes before Felix and um, he, de he declares uh, who he is. If you skip down to verse number 23, he says, And he commanded a centurion to keep Paul, 
and to let him have liberty that he should forbid none of the acquaintance to minister or to come unto him. And after certain days when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, which was a Jewish, and sent from, sent, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning what? The faith in Christ. So here now he has his wife with him, which by the way, he stole his wife from another man. So this is telling you a little about the governor Felix. And he now is asking Paul to come and explain your faith to me. So this is what I want you to get at because this is so key. He's now got an audience with a governor, a Roman governor, and he wants to know, tell me about your faith. And so we notice then here in verse number 25, doesn't go into all the details. And as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix did what? He trembled. Now it's interesting what it says here that he reasoned with them of righteousness, temperance, which is self-control of your indulgences, and judgment, meaning that God was going to judge someday, Felix trembled. I wonder if at that moment Felix is recognizing as Paul speaks, what he's speaking is truth. And what we need to understand is that when the Holy Spirit starts influencing people, they feel that pressure and that weight of their sin. You and I can't force people to have guilty conscience for their sin. That's something God does. Now we may feel guilt for hurting someone or doing something, but spiritual guilt is something that God opens that valve up and lets people feel that weight of pressure. I felt that prior to my salvation. Many of you had the same testimony, and hopefully if you're here, you're not saved, you would sense that same thing. Here, an ungodly governor who stole his wife from another man, and Paul is giving it to him just straightforward. Maybe he was sensed at that moment, okay, I am one of those unrighteous people before the eyes of God, and he started trembling. That was a true sign of conviction or fear. And he answered, go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. So in other words, he says, Paul, get out of here. <laughs> what we understand is that he was under some kind of conviction. But he told Paul, go away. And so many times, perhaps you as a Christian or I have, we've had opportunities to talk to people about our faith. And people seem genuine, ask questions, but at some point they just kind of shut you down. Like, okay, that's enough. Enough, John, I don't want to hear it anymore. It's like, okay, but you started asking questions. All right, fine, just, just go away. What does that mean? They're processing. Maybe the guilt was there from the Holy Spirit of God, but they'll make you the, the person who they're mad at because you're the voice at that particular time. But they're not mad at you. They're mad at the message. And sometimes people have to go through that process in order to come to faith. Now, we know, know nothing of Felix coming to faith but we do know that he was an ungodly man and he was trying to get money out of Paul. It says that later here, if you uh, look in here. He kept Paul prisoner for two years, hoping that he'd make money off of Paul, that Paul would pay him to let him go free. It never happened. And then a new governor comes in whose name is Felix. Felix takes over, or excuse me, Festus takes over for Felix. And so now that we have Festus coming in and taking over, we recognize now that uh, Festus is going to, catch up on this. What's going on? Why, why all this trouble about this one man who seems to be a professor of Jesus Christ? And, and why are the Jews trying to kill him? And so we notice then he has to come before Festus. And as he goes before Festus, same thing. Paul's able to share his testimony. Paul's able to share his story about his, his uh, salvation. But I want you to notice then in verse number nine, but Festus willing to do the Jews a pleasure, answered Paul and said, Wilt thou go up to Jerusalem and there be judged of these before me? Then Paul said, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat. In other words, here we have uh, Festus now saying, In order to keep the Jews happy, are you willing to go be judged by them? And he said, No. <laughs> he says, I've appealed to Rome. I'm not, I'm not going back before them. I know what they're going to do to me. And so Festus then is not sure what to do because he said, There's no evidence. There's no evidence that I, that I have, good evidence to take Paul to Caesar. He said, this is ridiculous. So King Agrippa comes in to pay tribute to Festus. And as King Agrippa comes in, he now wants to, to find out more information about this Paul. So we pick that up here in uh, Acts chapter number 25 and verse number 13. And it says, and after certain days, King Agrippa and Bernice, and again, Bernice is King Agrippa's wife, who is also his sister. Tells you a little bit about their morality, but that was 
not even accepted in that day, but that's who he was, unto uh, Caesarea to salute Festus. And when they had there many days, Festus declared Paul's cause unto the king, saying, There is a certain man left in bonds by Felix, the former governor, about whom when I was at Jerusalem, the chief priests and elders of the Jews informed me, desiring to have judgment against him, to whom I answered, It is not a manner of the Romans to deliver any man to die before that which he is accused. Have the accusers face to face and have license to answer for himself concerning the crime laid against him. And so he read, there's there's no evidence here that this man deserves death. What am I to do? King Agrippa, maybe you can figure this out. You're a Jew. Your background is Judaism. Now who's King Agrippa? This is King Agrippa II. His great-grandfather was Herod the Great, not a noble guy. We understand if you study the Herods, they were Jewish men of descent, but they were set up by Rome as puppet kings. They had no real power or authority, but they were backed up by the local governments because they wanted to keep peace, so they said, you want a king, Jews? All right, we'll pick a king for you. That's kind of the way it works. And so... The Jews did not respect the Herods. They did not care for them at all. But they had a kind of dual beast. They had to pay taxes to them to to take care of their luxurious lifestyles. But they had no respect for them because they did not obey the Jewish laws. They did not obey the religion. But they knew it because they were trained in it since they were young. And so this is the guy now that Paul is before. And he did not have to go before Agrippa, but he willingly did so because he already appealed to Rome. And now Agrippa has no authority over Paul. And so as we look here in in, uh, this particular portion of Scripture, Acts chapter 25, now in verse number, excuse me, let's skip forward to Acts chapter 26. I told you we'd be going through this very quickly. Acts chapter 26, notice in verse number 4. I want you to see, first of all, as now he is answering to Agrippa, giving his account of what took place, he's using this as an opportunity to give the gospel. And this is what I want you to get. Here's the takeaway. How did Paul present his story to Agrippa? Every one of you, if you're saved, you have a story of your salvation. You may not have a story like some others where, like Paul, I was a persecutor of Christianity. I put people to death. I I was able to abuse people. And then God met me and I saw the light and I came to faith in Christ. Marvelous testimony. But most of us don't have that kind of testimony. Some of you may have been saved out of an immoral lifestyle. Maybe some of you were on drugs or on alcohol. And through all that, you finally came to the end of self. And you said, I need Jesus in my life. You trusted Christ. And he's changed from the inside out. Some of you grew up in church. And as a young child, you just believed. You said, no, I just know this is true. And I believe it with my heart. You don't need to have this, quote, unquote, amazing lifestyle uh, transformation as someone who lived and sold their wild oats, then got saved. I think even more precious is someone who grows up, gets saved at a young age, and doesn't sow their wild, doesn't have to have the worldly experience because the baggage that comes along with our sinful lifestyle really can mess us up even as a Christian. It really can. Why have all that baggage so you can have a good testimony? That's silly. Get saved while you're young and live a life that honors God. I think that's even actually harder. And some of you parents need to really... Help your kids and understand that, to live a life that honors God instead of having this whatever dramatic testimony of being converted later in life after they've made such a mess of it. So Paul, first of all, I want you to notice here in verses 4 through 7, Paul declares his loyalty as a Jew prior to his salvation. Verse number 4, as he's speaking to Agrippa, my manner of life from my youth, which was at the first among mine own nation, Jerusalem, know all the Jews, which knew me from the beginning, if they would testify that after the most straightest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers, under which promises our 12 tribes instantly serving God, day and night, hope to come. For which hope sake, King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews. You say, what's Paul doing? Paul's giving his testimony of who he was as a Jew, and he's tying in now with King Agrippa, who he knows knows the same truths. He was trained in the scriptures. He would understand the Jewish traditions and Jewish laws. And he was going back now saying, the promises that were given to us as Jews, I believed and I practiced and I followed. 
And he said, there was no difference in our upbringing, King Agrippa. And then he goes on to say, so he, he talks about his manner of his life. Look, notice verse number 8, because this is a pivotal verse. There are certain questions that you can ask people to find out where their faith really lies. Verse number 8 was a test question for King Agrippa. The Apostle Paul at this point asked him a question that is so specific that it kind of is one of those ones that must make him think through what he really believes. Notice what it says here in verse number 8. Why should it be thought a thing incredible with you? Who's he talking to? King Agrippa. That God should raise what? The dead. One of the keys here was he was putting him on the spot and he was asking him, you know what our Old Testament says, you know about the deliverance of our people from the Egyptians, you know about the plagues, you know about the parting of the Red Sea, you know about the feeding in the wilderness, you know about Moses and Abraham, and you know about the prophets and all that they preached and what they prophesied would come someday. King Agrippa, you know this stuff. And why would you think it's any strange thing that God could raise Jesus from the dead. If you believe all that, why would you think that it's strange? What's he doing? He's making a point because this is the pivotal message of the faith of Christianity. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the key to our true belief in Jesus Christ. No other religion can claim that. We are the only faith that declares that our God raised from the dead. Why is that so important? It's so important because the resurrection from the dead demonstrates God's power. The resurrection from the dead verifies what the Old Testament states. The resurrection from the dead also gives you and I a hope of our future resurrection, going to heaven and being with God. Jesus was the first fruits from the dead. It verifies that someday, yes, we also will be there with him and we'll have a glorified body. This is so important and so imperative. And Paul was putting it right to King Agrippa. And he said, you believe all the Old Testament stuff. He goes, how could you not believe that God would send his son, his son would lay his life down for us and he would resurrect him from the dead? How could you not believe that if you believe all those other things? Next, I want you to notice that Paul describes his persecution of Jesus' followers. Verses 9 through 12, I won't read through it all, but he now is giving his personal testimony. Verse 9. I verily truly thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of, the, of Jesus of Nazareth. Now that Jesus of Nazareth was kind of a demeaning statement. When they said, what good thing comes from Nazareth? The answer to that is nothing. So when the Apostle Paul says, in my mind at that time as an unsaved, unconverted Christian, as a Jew who was not yet converted, only thing I thought about who could this Jesus from Nazareth be? This is just another hocus pocus. This is a guy just trying to, you know, treat Judaism wrong and try to get a following. And he said, and that's why I persecuted him. Verse number 10. Which thing I also did in Jerusalem and many saints. Now again, saints are not people that are in heaven you pray to. Saints are those who are true believers on earth at this time. And I did shut them up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests, and, and they were put to death. I gave my voice against them, and I punished them often in every synagogue, compelled them to do what? Blaspheme. And exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even to strange or other cities. Here's Paul declaring to King Agrippa, I was so loyal to Judaism... There was nobody more loyal than me to the Jewish faith that when I found about these people who were followers of this Jesus of Nazareth, I persecuted them as far as I could possibly persecute them, even to the point where they said, should we kill them? I said, yes, kill them. That was his testimony. Take them out. They're worthless, scum, horrible humans. They left Judaism for this faith. Folks, let me just give you a little side. Forced faith is never true faith. I don't care if you're trying to force somebody to Christianity, Islam, uh, you name the religion, Judaism. Forced faith is not real faith. A person must come 
being convicted of God to believe and follow a faith. There's no reason for us to force someone to be converted. It must be something that is done by God if they're going to have a true faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Next, we see that Paul declares the gospel and his calling. Look at verse number 13. It says, at midday, O king, and so he's now going on with his testimony, I was traveling to Damascus to persecute more Christians. And at midday, O king, I saw the way, the light from heaven, above the brightness of the sun, shining around about me, and them which journeyed with me. And when we were fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying unto, in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecute thou me? Is it hard for thee to kick against the pricks? And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom, you perse- whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand up upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose. Now, let's stop there for just a moment. Here we have the Apostle Paul on his way to persecute more believers. He's got authority from the temple, from the chief priests. He's going now with glee in his heart. He thinks he's doing service for God. And God meets him on the road to Damascus, knocks him off his horse, and then speaks to him. Now, don't miss this. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And the answer that always, I'm not persecuting you, I'm going after Christians. That should tell you something about our God. When people suffer for their true faith in Jesus Christ, he counts it as you're going against him. You ever had someone mock you? For going to church? You ever had someone mock you for giving out a gospel track? You ever had someone sneer at you or say something vile against you? you? Ever someone threaten you for giving the gospel? God takes note of all those things. Not that we should hope they get payback. We should hope for their conversion. But we understand that the Apostle Paul was convicted. You say, what do you mean he was convicted? He says, Saul, Saul, why? How, uh, how do you kick against the pricks? Now, I grew up a little part of my life on a farm. We had what you called a, a goad. They had long stick. You could make one yourself, just sharpen it with a, with a pocket knife, and you poke the, the cow so you get them going. We had electric ones. Those were fun. But you understand that these were to get a big beast moving forward. Back in Paul's day, they actually would use it for the oxes, and they had these sharp sticks that when the ox wouldn't move, they would just uh, jab them in the back of the legs. They got the leg to get up and keep going. They actually would also sometimes, when they had the ox on yoke and tie uh, a rope down attached to a board, and they would put the little uh, points sticking out towards the ankles of the, of the oxen. So if they stopped, they wouldn't go. That board would swing forward, and it would keep them moving along. They, weren't, they, they learned to get into a good pattern to keep walking without that hitting them. What was that? That was, that was the pricks. That was something that was poking them to get their attention. You say, what was, what was poking the apostle Paul that was getting his attention? I have no doubt, and again, it's my speculation, but the stoning of Stephen weighed heavy on the Apostle Paul's heart. And when he gave his voice for others to be put to death, and when he saw women and children and families being pulled out of their houses and beaten in the streets, and repent, do you tell us you don't believe in this Jesus, you convert back to Judaism, they would not. I'm sure after a while all those images were flowing back in his head, and God was just saying, okay, Paul, here's more, here's more. But he was being convinced and convicted in his heart that it was wrong. But he was still going forward. Still there was enough in him to believe he was doing right, but he was trying to now sound, block out those things. The Holy Spirit of God was working on Saul. And I say that to you because some of you are trying to witness to friends and family members. Some of you are trying to talk to people about their faith. And sometimes their reaction to you is so harsh that mark it down. Sometimes that's the prick That's the goad. It's not you. It's the message of the gospel. It's the Holy Spirit of God. And they're resisting that. Just like Paul did. They may know in their heart, just like Felix, just like Agrippa, that what he's saying is right. But they're not letting down their guard yet. And you just stay faithful. You stay true as a Christian. Let God do the pricking. You don't have to do it. You don't have to yell and scream. You don't have to get mad. You just keep living your life and giving out the truth of the Word of God. The Holy Spirit does a way better job at it than we do. And so we find there is that this is the stage that Paul is on. He's before King. He's giving his testimony. And I want you to fast forward here to verse number 25. 
because Felix or Festus interrupts and says, Paul, you're mad, you're crazy. In verse 25, he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. For the king, now he directs his attention back to King Agrippa, for the king knows that the, of these things, before whom also I speak freely, for I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him. For this thing was done, uh, not done in a corner. In other words, he knows way more than he's letting on. <laughs> And he's very aware of the truth of the scriptures from the Old Testament that point forward to Jesus being the true Messiah. If you would, go back to verse number 16 now. And we'll pick it up at the, the, the verse 16. But, I, but rise and stand upon thy feet. This is Jesus now speaking to Paul on, on the day of his conversion. For I have appeared unto thee for this purpose. What's the purpose? If God says, I've got a purpose for you, then I want to know that purpose. To make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen and those things in which I will appear unto thee. So both what you've seen now and what I will show you. You're going to be my witness, Saul. Verse number 17. Delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee. In other words, I'm going to deliver you, Paul. Verse number 18. For what purpose? Here it is to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Here it is. That was the message. Paul, I'm setting you up as a minister. You are going to be able to go before different people you're going to present the truth that I'm, I'm showing you here to open their eyes. And yet he's still before King Agrippa. Skip down, if you would, to me, with me to verse number 20. As he, as he turns his attention back to King Agrippa, verse 19, he says, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. Verse 20, but showed first unto them at Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea and unto the Gentiles that they should, what's the word? Repent and turn to God. Listen, folks, this is the first thing. When a person is convicted of their sin, when they understand that God is truly God and that, he, uh, that their sin is against God and that their rejection of God is, is something that's wrong, they are to repent of that. And only the Holy Spirit of God can convict someone of that and then cause them to want to change their heart and change their mind now to believing in Him. You can't convince them of that. I can't convince of that. That only comes from God. And notice then what it goes on to say. It says, repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. Now, I don't want you to be confused here because some people do this. Well, I know I need to believe in Jesus Christ, my Savior, but I also need to do this, 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 and this. Now, be careful. To truly be saved, to be one that's delivered from your sin debt, you trust the finished work of Jesus Christ alone. Jesus is God. He died on the cross for your sins. He paid the price for you. When you understand that and you ask Jesus Christ to come into your life and change you to, to be a follower of Jesus Christ, that's it. You're saved. You have a destination for heaven. But you must understand it and mean it. You don't just pray a prayer like one, two, three, repeat after me. You must really understand it and mean it. Now, what he says here, that they did meet the works meet for repentance, that was a term they used in that day, meaning, hey, if you're sincerely a follower, then live it. Live it out. Jane, James says it this way. He says, you tell me uh, that you're a person of faith. You show me your faith without works. James says, I'll show you my faith by my works. Now, that doesn't mean that was salvation by works. That means because I'm saved, I'm going to serve God. That's what I do as a Christian. I'm saved, so I'm going to go to church. I'm going to pray. I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to spend time trying to help other people come to faith in Christ. That's what we do as believers. And Paul was saying, that's what I preached, Agrippa. That's why I'm the uproar. I didn't quit Judaism. I believe the, the, the full length of it, that Jesus being a Jew is my Messiah. He's the one that we were waiting for. Agrippa, you know this. Now, I just want to end with this. Verse number 27. 
King Agrippa, here's the other question. Believest thou the prophets? Paul knew the answer. He says, yeah, I know you do. I know you believe the prophets, King Agrippa. And then you see King Agrippa's reaction. Verse 28. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuades me, persuadeth me to be a what? Christian. The title I gave to this message was Almost is Never Enough for Salvation. How many people think they're almost saved and it's good enough? How many people think that because they go to church that they're saved? How many people think that because they went through a ritual as a kid they are saved? How many people think that, well, I'm good enough that they're saved? No, almost is never enough when it comes to salvation. Either you believe the finished work of Jesus Christ, that he was God, he died on the cross, he was buried, he rose again from the dead, he proved he was God, and you ask him for forgiveness of your sins and deliver you in a relationship. If you don't believe Jesus Christ that way, then almost is never enough for salvation. What was Agrippa's holdup? Verse 18. He did not want to open his eyes to spiritual truth. He did not want to come out of darkness. Notice what it says there, to turn them from darkness to light. You know what it's like? Early in the morning, kids, adults, teenagers maybe? Lights come on, wake up, time to go to school. Or wake up, time to roll over and go to school. Homeschoolers, you know. Lights come on, it's like, whoa, 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 shut off the lights. Spiritually, that happens to us too. Hey, hey, pastor, I know what you're saying is right, but I'm good right now. I'm not ready for this yet. I want to live my life. I'll take my chances. I ministered to gangs in Chicago for a while, and I had this young lady who was wrapped up in the gangs, and she was actually my same age at that time. I think I was 19 or 20, and she was all dressed up that night. She was going out, and I stopped her on the street, and I talked with her for a little bit, and I said, I said, listen, you don't need to go out and do this. I said, and I, and I said, could I just present the gospel? She goes, go ahead. So I presented her the whole gospel message. She listened very clearly, and, and with a glisten in her eye, she said to me, I know what you're saying is right, John. She goes, but I don't want to give up this yet. She was talking about going out and partying with her, the guys and all this. I said, okay. I never saw her again after that. But I just wonder if that was her last opportunity. And I can tell you story after story like this. People that I witnessed to, they found out later were dead. Wondering, did they believe in their, before they died, their last breath, did they cry out to God? I hope, I don't know. But listen, King Agrippa right here clearly says, almost, Paul. Almost like it was a chess man. Almost, Paul, you almost got me. Not quite. I'm not giving up this lifestyle yet, Paul. I've got it good, Paul. If I have to give up what I have right now, Paul, that means I have to turn away from the sins that I enjoy. If I have to give up this life, I have to turn from the power I have right now under Satan. Look what I have without God, Paul. I've got a good life without God right now, Paul. I'm not ready yet. And that story could be repeated time and time. And that might be your story and my story when I was younger. But at one point do you say, okay, the truth is too real. I must repent. Turn to God. Ask Jesus Christ. Listen, when is almost not enough? When you're unwilling to bow your head to Almighty God and to say that Jesus Christ truly is God, and that he's the one that died for your sin, rose from the dead. And if you receive him as your personal Savior, you have eternal life. Don't let that pass you. Father, we thank you for the word of God once again. Thank you for how you recorded in the scriptures the personal lives and testimonies of people that we have grown to love through literature, through stories, and through these, what I believe, true stories. And the message of the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is still so poignant and profound for us today that we must receive that in order to be a true child of God. But some people still resist. And you know that we can't convince them, but Holy Spirit of God, you can